awesome. We're live, and I hope you don't face the issue this time. I can see your screen. That's awesome. Oh my gosh! Yeah, <laughs> I think we've already shaved like ten minutes of troubleshooting. <laughs> there was one time when my screen literally went off, and I was like oh, teaching <laughs> with the screen off. It keeps you humble. You know what I mean. It keeps you humble. Then you go like, you know what? I still can be better. So this PC is on power backup priorities, right? But the monitor isn't. So like all priorities there. So you could go offline again. Yeah. Let me make sure we're live. Yeah. Um. Interesting. Now I can see myself. Awesome. Sorry, everyone. We were just catching up with and behind the scenes. If you got some of the chat, uh, Wade will be teaching us about uh, mast and casual language model. Both of the things I clearly don't understand, as you could see from my expression. And I'm hoping Wade will make it clearer for me and all of us. So with that, over to Wade. And a reminder: this will be the last session in the series. So if you're still with us, thanks for. Uh, joining all of the sessions. I know Wade is an awesome teacher, so that's why you keep coming back. Hopefully, you'll also join some of my sessions and I'll try to live up to Wade's uh, legacy. I don't, set, I don't set the bar too high, so I don't think you're going to have any problems. It's quite high for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. All right. Well, anyways, yeah. Uh, welcome back. This is the um, last session in our part two study group. And as Sanya mentioned, we're going to be looking at... Um, language modeling. And so looking at both causal and mass language models. So uh, again, this is all in the slides. These are some helpful uh, resources. If you're all looking to get involved with fast AI, data science, or working with Hugging Face uh, on its own, or with fast AI, uh, we have, again, a few libraries that you can check out on the author and critter of the Blur Library, which we've been mostly using in uh, this course to uh, look at how to work with the, the mid and low level API that FastAI provides to uh, be able to work with and train uh, transformer models available from Hugging Face. So uh, yeah, Sonia said, we're gonna look at causal and mass language modeling. We're gonna follow the uh, the same steps that we've been following, following for all the other main NLP tasks. And uh, this will conclude the section seven, which really kind of does a deep dive on the end-to-end -end process of building transformers for the core NLP task, right? And uh, again, we have this uh, link here to the task resource on Hugging Face, which is really a fantastic summary of the core task, not just for NLP, you'll see the vision and speech, other things uh, that you can do with transformers. Um, and it gives you really good information about data sets to potentially experiment with uh, what the task is from uh, a high level, uh, what metrics to use, and also there's often links to uh, papers that you may want to check out. So uh, yeah, so we're going to go into uh, language modeling. And it's kind of funny, and I mentioned last week, is that we're kind of doing things backwards when you think about it. Um, all these core NLP tasks, these downstream tasks like token classification and question answering, summarization, all rely on a backbone, which is the language model. And so you may be curious as to why we're covering language modeling so late, that it, literally the last thing um, in this particular study group. And the reason is that I think a lot of folks are prematurely go to, oh, I got to build a language model or fine tune a language model to be able to get really good results on my classification problem. And the reality is that that's actually probably a lot more rare. And a better approach is, in my opinion, to go to the Hugging Face Hub, look at models, look at their model cards, and start with something, and preferably a distilled version, something that's small, that is pretty close to your particular target corpus rather than starting, I got to train everything from scratch. Because um, you can often find that you can fine tune a language model and think, okay, this is going to give me better results. But because the original pre-trained model was trained on vast amounts of data with bigger batch sizes, with you know better compute capabilities, that that won't always be the case. 
And in my experience in particular, um, I've never had to uh, fine tune or even train from scratch a language model for any of the work I've done. And I've done uh, extensive work with classification tasks, token classification and summarization. But you may need to, and it's good to understand what a language model is because literally everything that we're that we've looked at uh, with regards to the transformers model uh, models uh, has a language model as the backbone. So what is a language model? Um, this is from Fastbook. Uh, a language model is a model that's been trained to guess the next word in a text. And in the case of a causal language model, having read the ones before, right? And you're predicting the next word. For a mass language model, we're going to mass tokens or words or phrases or corrupt the inputs uh, somewhat. And then we're going to try to guess what the uncorrupted version should be. So for causal, this is you're trying to guess the next word. And the key is that to properly guess the next word in a sentence, the model will have to develop an understanding of the English or other language. And this is the intuition that um, if you look up and read the ULM fit paper that uh, uh, Jeremy published with Sebastian Ruder years ago, and it's also discussed in the fast book. Um, the idea is if you can build a model that can do this, can predict the next word, then you have a model that has some understanding of the grammar, the style, the syntax of whatever language you're training it in. And such a model then can be applied to other tasks, uh, such as classification or um, name entity recognition or summarization because of that. And so that intuition was literally what drove them to build ULM fit, which by the way, is a great paper uh, that uses an LSTM. Um, but the, but conceptually, uh, the idea is the same. So um, when do you, when do you want to fine tune a language model? So again, fine tuning is different than train pre-training, right? Fine tuning is we're going to take an existing language model uh, with a, a with a set of uh, tokens that are already defined in the vocabulary that already have a representation um, in the model. And we are going to have it look at our corpus and improve the representation of our the words in our corpus. Um, when is it helpful to do that? Uh, it it helps to get the style of the corpus we are targeting. It may be more formal language or more technical with new words to learn or different ways of composing sentences. So if you look at the Hugging Face course, and also if you read the fast book, you'll see that IMDB is a uh, case study in this. So IMDB is English, which means we could use most English uh, or most models that are trained on an English corpus but it has some unique things in there, right? That maybe wouldn't come out in Wikipedia per se, such as names of movie directors and actors. And also the style is different than Wikipedia, right? It's much less you know, formal with people trashing or glowing about uh, movies. So in that case, it may be helpful to fine tune such a model. And so the questions to ask um, before you get to this point is, um, does your target corpus, does it contain a lot of domain specific words? Um, and these are words that may appear like in Wikipedia, but because of the corpus itself, the idea, the meaning behind them may be a little bit different and your target corpus uh, may not have the fullest representation um, uh, because it has a more narrow meaning. And so in that case, you may want to uh, fine tune a language model. Uh, the second one, does it contain a lot of words that may require you know, a different numerical representation based on the target domain as compared to that of the corpus used for pre-training? And third is, does it have a style that is very different um, from the corpus used for pre-training? So we talked about formal versus informal. Um, you could have, um, uh, potentially a target corpus that has a bunch of emojis or things like that, that you, that these pre-trained models may not have seen when they look at Wikipedia. So um, those are things to think about. 
And again, this is kind of the last resort. Like don't start with, okay, I have these different words in here. I think the meaning may be different. Start with the pre-trained model, see what the results are, get your training and evaluation loop working. And then if the results aren't good enough or you got extra time, explore fine tuning. And then um, as a last ditch thing to do, if you're not getting the results you want and you have a target corpus, that's very different. And so in the class, we saw where we were um, training language models from scratch because we had a we had models that were pre-trained on something like Wikipedia and text, but we were trying to create a language model that understood Python code. And we saw that when the tokenizer ran, for example, it created like a lot more tokens that were than were really needed. And it wasn't capturing the main ideas of what Python looked like in terms of indentation or comments um, or like how we delineate uh, classes or methods. And so in that sense, uh, it definitely made sense to train a language model from, from scratch. And so some of the examples that they talk about in the course, in addition to the programming language uh, example I just mentioned uh, was like your target corpus consists, consists of musical notes or molecular sequences such as DNA. And so again, this is really, if you can't fine tune and you really have something very different, then you wanna explore uh, actually building a language model from scratch. And these often take a lot of time and are sensitive to things like batch size. So if you look at some of the papers and you talk to folks that are training these language models that we're using in the course, um, you'll find that their batch sizes are like gigantic. Uh, it's taken, you know, days and weeks to train these type of models. So again, this is kind of like if you got something very different, go ahead and look at um, a pre-trained uh, a pre-training language model from scratch, and uh, try to get as much commute compute as you can uh, to do that. Okay, so let's go ahead and kind of go through our steps for um, language modeling. We're going to look at code for. Um, uh, causal language model uh, task, but it's pretty easy to adapt that to um, mass language modeling. And uh, one thing I wanted to uh, make sure folks knew is that we have the data sets library, which provides tons of uh, data sets for us to, to use. And it's awesome because you can read about um, how it was developed. You can explore it on the Hugging Face website, but there's also uh, a bunch of data sets available from uh, fast AI. And so in the slides, I've linked to the data sets uh, page. And what's nice about this is that they've, they're already trimmed versions of data sets that you're already using. And so they download fast and they're really helpful to use for experimentation. And when you're just starting the development of your, your process and your troubleshooting things, because the last thing you want to do is be training a language model and have that thing running for a couple of days. And then just to find out you've pooched the evaluation loop and you start getting errors. So um, a lot of really helpful for a, a variety of different tasks. And for language modeling, they actually include a subset of the Wikitext 103 called Wikitext 2. And uh, going back to Colab here. Uh, once Could we, you please zoom in? Uh Oh, yeah. Maybe I need to like get my eyes tested again, but I'm always making this ask yeah. every week. How's that look? Is it better or you want me to go? Yeah, more? I can read now. Okay. I should also get my eyes tested. Sorry yeah. to interrupt. I think it was my fault. I think maybe I was I, I was testing you, and so I had it down at like 75. <laughs> but I uh, failed the test. Yeah. Sorry about that. Um, but yeah, so we're gonna do the the pip install from the dev2 branch, do all of our imports, and um Getting data from FastAI, if you've taken the course or gone through the FastBook, is really easy. So there's this um, uh, URLs module and uh, has references to a bunch of those data sets that are um, discussed and described uh, on the website. And simply, this is going to download it uh, using Untar data. If it hasn't been downloaded already, um, it's going to... Um, uh, uncompress it and then give you the path where everything's at. 
And so this uh, particular data set uh, gets you a train and uh, test CSV file. Uh, we can also um, work, build a, a data frame from that. We can combine that. Um, in this particular case, I'm combining it, but you'll see that when we pre-process, we're gonna do these um, a little bit separately. And you can see like, yeah, it uh, just is a bunch of text. And so the big thing with doing a language model is you want a lot of text. And whether you're doing uh, Wikipedia or like IMDB or uh, product reviews or whatever, it's pretty easy to find things like that. So um, yeah, so basically you want a lot of text. And once you have that, you are ready to go. So we now have our kind of raw data set. We go through the process of getting our hugging face objects. And with blur, we can just use the get HF objects to get everything in uh, one line. And one of the things that we've been asking as we've during the series is, okay, well, what kind of um, model should we be looking at for language modeling task? And the answer is both encoder only and decoder only. And so if we're doing a causal LM, that would be something like GPT-2. Uh, typically, you'll find that decoder-only models are going to be your go-to architecture. And in particular, uh, as mentioned early on in part one of the course, uh, they're good for generative task. So remember, we looked at the idea of a language model is, or at least a, that that uh, is talked about in FastBook, the causal language model, is that given a bunch of words prior, predicting the next word is what we're trying to accomplish. And that's what happens with decoder only models. And so they're really good for uh, text generation. Now, if we're doing a mass language modeling uh, task, typically we're going to find that encoder only models are the preferable choice. Um, and an example of an encoder only model would be something like BERT, which really started this whole idea of being able to um, apply attention both forward and backwards and uh, essentially simulate that next product, uh, prediction task by uh, using a mass filling tax, task where instead of uh, predicting the next word, we're trying to predict uh, masked or corrupted words uh, in the text. And so um, if you're building an, uh, an uh, for a mass language modeling task, look at encoder only. And so again, really simple um, with uh, blur, we can go ahead and use the get HF objects and the type of auto model we're looking for is the causal LM. And I'm gonna start with GPT-2. And also some of these models uh, don't include a pad token and you just have to add it in. So just be aware of that because um, we're gonna be training on uh, batches and there's going to, it's going to require padding uh, when we train uh, these models. So you may have to add it in. And so I'm adding it in because GPT-2 doesn't have one. Okay, and then uh, probably the, the most important part of language modeling is how do you arrange your, your text? How do you set it up? And essentially what we want to accomplish is uh, we, we want to use as much of the text as we can. And we want to set it up in contiguous chunks to make that happen. And so the nice thing is, is that this pre-processing that we want to do is the same for causal as it is for mass. Uh, language modeling. And so um, introduced like in the course, they talk about, they actually they actually introduced several ways of pre-processing. This is by far the best one because it drops the least amount of um, uh, text. So it gives us the maximum amount of text to train on. Uh, and that is to concatenate all the examples and then split the, the whole corpus into chunks of equal size. Uh, and we actually have a pre-processing function in Blur that does this. Um, the big question that you have to ask yourself is how big should your chunks be? And again, this really depends on your compute constraints. Um, for Blur, I actually developed most of it on a 
pretty old now 1080 ti that has like a max of you know under 12 gigabytes of ram so so i uh so i have to do yeah, basically have very small chunks and very small batch sizes when i'm developing things um based on my compute constraints and if you're not sure where to start you can check out the tokenizer um the model max length property and that will at least give you a good potential baseline to start with um, and then also just as an important note that they mentioned in the class is that using a small chunk size can be detrimental uh, in your particular uh, scenario. So you really have to do some EDA and understand the text that you're trying to work with uh, to figure out something that's going to um, be meaningful for your particular task and give you good results. So, so I keep going to that screen. Uh, so if we go to uh, pre-processing, it's really simple. Um, we have our text and you can see that's just here in the uh, first column. And I'm going to specify a chunk size of 128. And so what it's going to do is it's going to process this in batch fashion. Um, and it's going to take a look at essentially a thousand examples at a time it's going to concatenate all of them and it's going to chunk that into 120 uh, token segments. And then for the last one, because it's going to be smaller and probably be not only unhelpful, but maybe even detrimental to our modeling, because there's not going to be much to learn in that last particular chunk, we drop that last one. And um, that's what our LM uh, preprocessor does. And also notice that instead of uh, uh, pre-concatenating or using the pre-concatenated version of our train and validation. I'm actually going to pass these in separately so that they're processed separately. And our pre-processor will return these back in a single uh, data frame and also add that is valid column that we can use in our data block. And with that, we get to our next step, which is uh, creating a uh, data block and this is a uh this task is considered uh something that they call a self-supervised task which means that for language modeling and one of the nice things with language with with any self self-supervised task is that you don't have to divide uh, to define or construct or do anything with special with creating the labels the labels are essentially the inputs and um so we can go ahead and um, construct our transforms and our blocks to actually simply build those for you. And so if you look at blur, depending on whether you're doing a causal task or you're doing a mass, uh, a like a mass language model task, uh, and you need the decoder input IDs, or you need to have the input shifted, uh, one token to the right, um, it will just do that uh, for you. So when we actually look at the um, code here, you'll see that we use that same no-op um, uh, method to basically tell our data block that, hey, we don't need to do anything for the targets. Uh, the targets are gonna be handled um, right here by our uh, text block transform. So to um, define our data block, uh, we're going to, uh, use a new batch tokenized transform called LM batch tokenized transform. And one of the things that we are going to tell it that's a little bit different than the, um, the core batch tokenized transform is what strategy we want to use. And so in Blur, how we actually construct our labels uh, varies by these things called strategies. And we have two of them in, in, in Blur and it's set up so that there's a base class and you can subclass it and create your own strategies um, and uh, for, for how you want to basically build your labels. And then once you have your, um, uh, your LM strategy, and so in Blur we have causal, I also have a, a BERT mass token strategy that, that mimics the BERT paper in terms of how it mass tokens. Uh, once you have that, you can go ahead and specify that as your LM strategy class. And that will ensure that as your uh, raw data is um, processed, that the labels are generated 
uh, correctly for whatever you're trying to do. Um, and as a uh, just as an FYI, you may want to look at the T5 paper uh, because they actually have a pretty good discussion of a variety of of corruption methods that you may not be familiar with. Um, so not just tokens, like for the on the mass language modeling side, uh, beyond just masking tokens or words, they also will mask phrases or they'll move phrases or sentences or words around and you have to predict the right order. So there's a lot of potential uh, strategies that um, I'll probably explore adding the blur and uh, you really, whatever you can dream of and whatever you wanna try, you can actually probably uh, build something uh, here and use it with this particular uh, data block code and be good to go. So, um, so yeah, so we're working with a causal uh, language model, which is uh, going to be based on GPT-2. So we'll specify an input uh, return type of causal LM text input, and that's so that our uh, type dispatch methods, our show batch and show results uh, can work correctly. And then other than that, it's pretty much uh, business as usual with uh, using the mid-level API and creating our data block. And once we have that, we're going to create our data loaders. Always the best practice is once your data loaders are good to go, call one batch and take a look at what you have in there. And so we can see there's actually a, a little bug that I got to uh, look at here. This should actually be maxed out at 128, but I'm getting one extra token in there. Uh, but we can see that we have our input IDs right and our labels are going to be the same because in the causal uh, task, they're just shifted over to the right. So we're going to see the, ten the same uh, tensor shape in our input IDs as we see in our labels. And then we can also uh, do the show batch. I may change this a little bit. This doesn't really give you a lot of helpful information because it's the same thing. Um, but yeah, so we're good to go. Uh, so once we have our data loaders, we are ready. We have something that we can actually uh, model. Uh, the next thing is thinking about, well, what are the metrics that we care about? And the two that are most likely uh, to be of interest to you are perplexity and accuracy. And so if you look at the task page on that Hugging Face task resource, uh, you'll see them uh, recommend uh, perplexity. and I. I think accuracy, I'm not positive. Um, but perplexity is really, sounds fancy, but it's really a simple concept. And in the uh, course, I can't remember who does the video, but actually um, there's a really good description of like how it works and like what it means intuitively. And it simply is a measurement of how surprised or perplexed uh, the model is um, by the predicted word or token. And so the idea is, is that if the model is really confused and surprised by what it's predicting, then your language model probably hasn't done a really good job of capturing the particular uh, grammar of your target corpus. Uh, and so in that case, you're going to have a high perplexity. Uh, whereas if it uh, isn't surprised, then we should get a lower score for this metric. And it's an easy metric to calculate because it's just the exponential of your cross entropy loss, which is already being calculated since, again, we are looking at uh, where essentially whether it's uh, masked or it's the next token, we're, sim we're simply ap applying a, um, a cross entropy to actually calculate our loss. So all we got to do is take the exponential of that, and that gives us our perplexity. Uh, the other metric that's helpful is uh, accuracy. And again, it's just telling us like how often did we predict the correct next word or how often did we predict the correct mask word? So given that with, uh, with blur, surprise, surprise, uh, we have a um, LM metrics callback that you can use that will correctly calculate that for you. And we include this as a callback, we, especially when you're using a mass language model the tokens that we're not predicting are going to have a label of negative 100. And if you remember, that's a magic number that tells cross entropy loss, ignore that particular token. Uh, and so the, 
the Elementrix callback ensures that when we um, calculate um, our metrics that it does, it, it only looks at the masked tokens that we're actually concerned with predicting. And so we can go ahead and pass that. Uh, once we have our learner set up, um, again, by default, we're going to uh, include the labels. Um, if you didn't want to include the labels and calculate the loss uh, with fast AI in your data block, uh, you would have to pass include labels uh, equals false. By default, it's true. And if we leave the defaults as is, the hugging face models will actually, as it, part of the forward pass, it will actually calculate the loss um, for you. And what we need to do is, since we're using cross entropy, uh, loss is set our loss function to pre-calculated cross entropy loss so that um, when we actually uh, show both the results and inputs and for it to work in fast AI, um, we have to have this method that has like a decodes and encodes method for being able to um, show the results of the, the pre-calculated uh, loss in the transformer model. So once we have uh, that set up, I will add perplexity as one of the metrics that we want to look at. This is available in fast AI. Uh, we can, uh, again, just like we do for uh, batches, another best practice is to run a uh, batch of the inputs through our model and make sure that we're getting things that we expect. And uh, so we can do that simply by creating a batch. Um, uh, calling learn.model and passing uh, those inputs in to get our predictions. And so we can go ahead and uh, look at the uh, information that uh, is returned. And there's quite a bit, um, but we can see that just like with most uh, hugging face, actually not most, I think all of them, uh, we actually get an object and you can see it includes the loss, it includes our logits, and potentially other uh, information. So once we have uh, our learner and our uh, metric set up, we've verified that our batches look right and that we can actually process um, uh, predictions. The next step is to actually train our model. And uh, again, uh, it works just like any other fast AI model. Um, and also, uh, if your cases are involving generative text, so like what we're doing with GPT-2, we're probably building maybe something like a chatbot or something. Um, uh, make sure, again, you check the, um, that I referenced last week, that uh, article, how to generate text using different decoding methods for language generation with transformers. Uh, I'll give you some good guidelines of potential uh, hyperparameter uh, selection or choices you want to make uh, when you're doing generative uh, tasks. Uh, in our particular case uh, here, uh, we're just going to use the uh, LR finder to get some reasonable options for um, uh, setting our learning rate. And then we're going to uh, just go ahead and uh, fit for one cycle. Again, these things could run for a long time. And, uh, and so go get yourself a cup of coffee or I have to say this because Sanyam's on, on board, go get yourself a cup of chai uh, as well. Either option is um, allowed. So we're going to go ahead and uh, <laughs> I had to say that I think contractually I was obligated to, to mention chai in, in almost every single broadcast. I mean, either way, I, I got to you to mention it. So that's a no, win <laughs> That would be the quote over there on, on Twitter. Go get some chai, start training your language model, and go get some chai. Chai stabilizes your mind and training both. And, oh my goodness, wow. Yeah, that's a, that's a, I never do that right there. <laughs> you know, there's the fast book, there's the Transformers book. The only thing that's missing is the chai book, you know, and you could use the, uh, the, the uh, notebook's way of building it out. And I would love to get a signed edition if you make that happen. <laughs> I'll, I'll need a lot of chai to make that book happen. So Perfect. All right. All right. It's a recursive loop. <laughs> Keep us posted. So, uh, so yeah, so we train it just like normal. Um, we can call show results. 
And what Show's doing is actually it's decoding the predictions. And uh, when you work with most, um, and it's just using a greedy decoding mechanism here. I don't know how helpful this is. This may be changed here uh, once I release uh, or uh, V2 um, to production and make it available just as the normal pip install. But right now it's just showing the decoded predictions, which, and a lot of times when you're working with decoder only models and you're generating text uh, is a lot of gibberish. And that's why it's really important to look at that article and figure out like ways to potentially change those uh, hyperparameters related to text generation to get something uh, more meaningful. So that's training um, for inference. Uh, we can actually use, we have um, two methods in blur. Um, if we're doing text generation, we can use um, blur dot or blur generate. And if we are building a mass language model, we can go ahead and use blur fill mask and have it predict what the, um, uh, the mask or mask um, should be. Um, the big thing is, is that in addition to being able to use this for inference in this fashion, um, again, we can, uh, we, we've essentially built a language model that we can now use as the backbone for the other core NLP tasks that we talked about. And this is actually probably the more likely scenario. And you're likely trying to do something like name entity recognition or question answering. And, um, you want to have an LM that's that's been fine-tuned on your target corpus. Um, so once you have that, um, you can actually use it just like we've used these other checkpoints like Distill Roberta or uh, uh, BERT or BART Base or BART Large. We can use our trained LM in the same fashion. So um, if we go to inference, we can see that um, again, get rid of the metrics, uh, go back to FP32 so that you can create a export um, pickle file. Once you have that, you can go ahead and use load, loan, load learner to um, basically build a uh, inference learner. And you can see here, I'm gonna call blur generate. And remember all those interesting hyperparameters that I was talking about that you can play with. Uh, you can pass those here and it will apply that to the uh, text generation. And you can see that given this particular um, example, um, setting the max length equal to 50, um, allowing it to do sampling and also use uh, uh, top K of uh, 25. And uh, again, if you look, if you read that article, you can see what those, what these things mean and where they may be helpful or harmful depending on your particular task. And so we start with a, um, uh, we give it some context, blur is fun to work with because, and then it creates some crazy answer. Blur is fun to work with because it is easy to learn and fun to play as they can communicate with anyone else in the world. Um, so pretty good. I don't know if I'm going to set that up as the description of blur on my GitHub but um, definitely fun to um, be able to play with um, this and kind of see what makes more sense for what you're trying to do. And that's it. And so for homework, I would say go through the course. And since this is our last session, if you haven't done any of the course, start with part one and go through those uh, sections. Once you get to part two, go through those sections as well maybe reference the material that we uh, talked about, but there's definitely um, a lot more depth to the part two content. And I don't know if and when they're doing a part three, so you got time to really kind of go through it slowly, take notes, go back through things, ask questions, and really make sure you understand, you know, how transformers work, how these different architectures work. And uh, in terms of language modeling, how the pipelines work, uh, for just being able to do inference. And then also from section seven, how to actually build end-to-end -end causal and mass language models. Um, and we've shown how to do a causal language model in Blur, but you'll also find um, a lot of examples in the course, how to do that with their trainer API and with also their Accelerate API, which is more like creating your own custom training and eval loop. 
And so there's a lot of um, good things to learn um, just by going through the course. And that's it. And uh, so I'm going to see if there's any questions or comments. Um, first of all, so for anyone who's joining us live, can you please, uh, I know you're on the other part of the screen, but can we please get an applause for Wade and a thank you for Wade for really, really making these sessions so awesome. Uh, I'm a noob at NLP and uh, even though I'm able to answer Wade's question that he throws at me just to check my knowledge, <laughs> but all of these sessions happen to happened because of his help so uh please join me in thanking wade and for all of his awesome work here he's literally created this framework for all of us for uh no reason apparently oh thank you yeah yeah i just did it for just you know the heck of it i was like you know what i don't need to sleep so yeah thank you so much i really appreciate uh you sanyam i appreciate everybody sticking with me i know it's uh been a slog since part one and part two is again so so much uh more denser so i really appreciate um everybody that's been on here being able to beat a lot of folks here and also on um twitter and um i hope that there'll be more of these type of podcasts in the future and uh, I'll, I'll always have my coffee and who knows maybe one of these days a, a cup of chai ready so yeah so thank you very, very, uh, a lot sanyam and, and thank you everybody for being a part of this all, all thanks to you. Uh, many people are saying thanks as I'm trying to continue highlighting that. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Thank uh, you. But uh, just to point out to the folks, we wanted to host a competition, uh, which we will not next week. Uh, so the world's best deep learning course, Fast AI starts in a few weeks and we want to invite more and more people. Competitions are more awesome when more people join because then... Uh, People like me get depressed because you're I'm on the bottom of the leaderboard. <laughs> Other people like you might get excited because you might be above. So we'll we'll align it with that. We'll keep you posted on that. Please follow Wade on Twitter. You'll be informed of that. I want to give a shout out to two competitions that might be somewhat relevant here. Um so I saw I think uh martin in the chart as well i'm not sure if it was him or someone else uh martin hens is i think as I, as far as i understand world's first colonel's grandmaster and he was ranked number one for a really long time he's been curating notebooks every single week kaggle notebooks that he calls hidden gems and those are like really awesome reads like uh just spend three months reading through all of those notebooks you'll learn so much i can guarantee you that he'll be launching a competition in i think two weeks that would be an awesome venue in the meantime while you wait for our competition to launch rob muller who's a 3x kaggle grandmaster he has an awesome twitch channel uh, you can find the link here has just launched a kaggle competition which involves music classification so still somewhat related I would highly encourage everyone to check these two competitions out if you can't wait for ours and uh, you're welcome to join ours. Just follow Wade and you'll find it as soon as it launches. Yeah, the music one actually really, uh, if you're interested in doing that, think about what we just talked about, like with the uh, language modeling, this would be a good example to probably explore, you know, training a, an LM from scratch and also probably a lot of fun too. I'll, I'll mention one quick rule. Uh, which should make this more interesting. So no pre-trained models are allowed and everything needs to be created from scratch. Oh, yeah, cool. Um, awesome. But uh, thanks again, Wade. And thanks to everyone who's been joining us uh, every week. I know Wade is awesome. That's why you all join. Uh, please consider joining other sessions, which unfortunately will have just me. Uh, but uh, thanks again, Wade. And thanks, everyone. Yeah, thank you. All right. We'll see everyone.